It's Q&A time. I love doing these Q&A videos. Got my action camera, I go, do it, kind of like walk and talk style, right? Helps me a lot. I think it's more interesting to watch than me just like sat at my desk or sat in a field somewhere. Really, we've crossed the border, we're in Leighton today. I've got lots of questions, so many questions. Um, and I'll get through as many as I can. The ones I can't get through, I'll endeavor to answer where you ask them on Instagram or on YouTube. I just wanna show you this building. Look, I love this building here. This is an old industrial building, as you can see. I think they used to manufacture like tents for the army, which is kind of mad, isn't it? Right, let's do the first question. So there are 80 questions. <laughs> on YouTube alone, plus the ones I received on Instagram. So I clearly can't answer all of them in this video, but I'll have a go. I'm just gonna scroll through these on my phone on the YouTube. Uh, I love this one. This is, I think this is a slightly mischievous one. It says, John, uh, I love the channel. Have you ever visited Norwich? Would you ever consider filming there? Now, I think that's in response to the fact that I've posted some photos on my um, Instagram from Norwich. Um, I have visited Norwich a few times. I think I'm allowed to say now, um, my son's at uni up there. So uh, he, he was in the Berlin video and uh, he wrote a brilliant blog post about that um, on, on, on my blog. I'll link to that below in the comments. So I've been up there a few times. That's why I've been there. You've seen me post photographs on Instagram, but there's been no video because I've, <laughs> I've been rather occupied, but I really want to make a video there. And I will do that maybe you know, soon. Um, but I want to do it justice because Norwich is an amazing city. If you've not been there, wow. If I'd have known about that years ago, who knows? Um, but I love Norwich. It's fantastic. Sorry, look. You probably can't hear, but there's some singing coming from the church. Let's go and stand outside the church. I love this church. So I will make a Norwich video. Something, isn't it something like it has a a church for every week of the year and a pub for every day of the year or something. Um, it has more medieval churches than any other city in Europe. Some amazing facts, but I love it. It's a beautiful medieval city. By the way, so I might just drop in some clips, <laughs> uh, some, just some footage of previous videos, just to break this up so it's not just my face walking and talking for what could be quite a long video It'd make it more interesting wouldn't it if there's a little bit of b-roll some nice kind of like landscapes <laughs> i love this nickname do you know cpr i don't but i probably should you know because i'm out in the streets a lot it would be a useful thing to learn um what's the oldest street in london that's a really good question i think the oldest street in london i'm going to give the answer it'd be interesting there will be other answers in the in the comments i think the oldest street in london is watling street isn't it uh, which got, it's got different names in different places, but it's the old, well, they think it originated as a, possibly as a migrationary route for, for various animals. And then it became an, a trackway when humans moved here. So it's possibly as old as the human settlement of the island, perhaps. Um, the old Kent Road is possibly the most sort of easily identifiable bit of that. Again, I'll link to a video where I'm walking part of Watling Street through London. Interesting, the next question is also a kind of out of London question, which is interesting. Um, I love your videos and living vicariously through you. Oh, sorry, I was answering a different question. Um, I know you've been working on a new book. Do you have any idea when it will be available and is there a place we can pre-order it from? That is a genuine question. It's not me just using this as a means to plug my book. Um, I'm working on the final edits now and I've really been dragging my feet over it. Maybe it's because it's the last bit and I haven't got a publisher breathing down my neck so I'm going to self-publish it. So I keep meaning to finish those edits any day. I'm hoping to have it available to order online before Christmas. Let me put it that way. That's, that's as ambitious as I'm going to be now. I wanted to have it published by, by now. Then it was the end of October. Then it was before the World Cup because I was going to do a, Well, I still hope to do a launch event, but I'm not sure I can. Um, I have to wait and see. So the launch event now might not be till early next year, but I really want to get published this year, 2022. So just as soon as I pick, <laughs> pull my finger out, I'm finished it. It's all written. I'm just going through and refining the edits and I want to work a little bit on the design perhaps. So that'll be it. So, oh, sorry, the question I meant to answer was from James, big fan of your walks and takes on things. Thank you. Um, if you had to up sticks and move to a different UK city, which one would it be and why? 
Um, it's a difficult question to answer that. To be honest with you, James, if I had to up sticks and move to a different UK city, I've been to a few that I really like, but I feel like it feels a little bit odd to move somewhere where you have no connection, you don't know people and stuff. So I've got a family um, on the Kent coast. That's the most logical place if we had to live somewhere else, but that's not a city. It doesn't really answer your question. I mean, I really like Norwich. Norwich is great going up there as I have done. I've probably been up there like about five times now, I think. Seems like a really nice place. Seems to have all the elements that we look for in a place to live. Yeah, Norwich is a little bit like um, Modena or Bologna in Italy, where I lived in Modena. And I remember thinking at the time when we moved back here, just before we started a family, if I could find a city like Bologna in the UK, I'd consider living there. And we never really did. Uh, I feel like Norwich is probably that city. So for the sake of answering this question, a city, I'd probably say Norwich, because it's one where I visited there a few times. I've got a little bit of a story there now through my son. So maybe Norwich question from Amy and Dan. Uh, have you considered going for walks in the Midlands, Northamptonshire or Leicestershire? Some really lovely places and we'd love to have you. Oh, thanks for Amy and Dan. Um, the Midlands, yeah, for sure. Well, Birmingham, I've been meaning to make another Birmingham video. I made quite a short one a few years ago when I was up there for a festival screening. I've always wanted to go back and do a, another Birmingham video, maybe around the canals, maybe do the Tolkien Trail. But Northamptonshire and Leicestershire, no. I mean, I did go to the, the Leicestershire countryside years ago. And um, it was great. I mean, a long time ago, when I was like 19, 20 years old. Uh, but that's a great suggestion. Thank you for that. I'll put that on the list. I would have overlooked that. Um, oh, book recommendations for someone that is new to psychogeography and you can't include your own. Oh. So I'm going to do these off the top of my head. As I've done all the answers to these questions, I think it's the best way to honestly answer stuff. So you want a kind of psychogeography thing. I'd say go for, um, it's called The Secret City by Simon Sadler. I think it's called The Secret City. I'll correct this on the screen if it's wrong, but it's a book by Simon Sadler, The Situationist City, sorry. It's The Situationist City by Simon Sadler. That's a really good introduction to psychogeography. Um, it's, he's an academic, but it's very accessible and it's got lots of, um, good material in it. Leave in the 20th century as well by Christopher Gray. There's two for you. They're not like um, narrative books at all, they're non-fiction books. The um, Leave in the 20th century is a collection of situationist writings. I mean, they're both focused on the situationists, really, because I think if you're new to it, go back to the source and then work your way forward to the people who have kind of drawn from that to create other works. My question is, this is from Barry, you clearly adore your collection of books, but are there any in particular that hold a special place in your heart and why from Baz? I, th I think the one I have to say, Baz, I mean, my Ian Sinclair books definitely do, particularly London Orbital holds a really special place in my heart. Significant book, but I think if you're looking at like the topographical books, particularly the ones, if you've seen me do a video from my study, have you? If you're a support on Patreon, that's where I do my Patreon videos from. But uh, The Fringe of London by Gordon S. Maxwell is probably that, um, it's probably that book, Walking Past the School, this week in here. And that was really the book that kind of, it kind of unlocked a link for me between some of the more sort of modern literature around walking, the sort of Ian Sinclair stuff, some of the sort of psychogeography and some of the more theoretical stuff, in a way, although Maxwell was writing about, you know, the areas around London that were just becoming absorbed into London. And it, in a way, it provided that kind of missing link and an attitude that I could relate to, but was also from the past. So it gave this thing that I do a kind of heritage that it felt like it didn't necessarily have. It gave it some proper deep roots. They didn't just come from some sort of French intellectuals and situationists in Paris in the 50s and 60s, nor did it come from artists kind of picking up those things in the, um, you know, around that time, 70s, 80s, you know, has some deeper roots. That's why I love the Fringe of London. And it's how I met my mate, Nick Papadimitrio, through that book, uh, walking past the big telephone exchange in Leighton now. And then over the other side of the road, there's a really interesting building. I think all of these things must be featured in a video where I go into it, where I'm not just 
answering questions as I walk past. If you could suddenly be transported back in time during one of your walks, where would you wish to be and in what century? That varies quite a bit, actually. There are a few, I'll combine actually, a number of questions. There's that and there's the, which period of London's history would I most like to go back to, etc. Well, I often think the period of London actually, and I've answered this question I think three or four times, but it's always good to answer it, would be um, just after the Romans leave London and essentially the old Roman city becomes abandoned. I've always loved to see that period of time. It does crop up actually in one of the Ben Aronovich novels. I think there's a character whose story starts there. One of the, I think it's one of the um, river deities. Or is it the male No, it's the malevolent spirit, isn't it? The uh, revenant spirit is somebody who had something bad happen to him at that period of time. Um, so I'd love to see that, the collapse of Roman London and the abandoned city. Maybe it'd be like 50 years, 100 years after the Romans have left. Um, it's like a suddenly big transport back in time though. I often feel that when I'm walking out in the countryside and I quite like to go back to the, the Bronze Age and see what Bronze Age Britain was really like because I feel like it's probably more sophisticated than we give it credit for and there would have been lots of different cultures, different languages. I'd love to see what language they spoke, how they communicated, the reality of how they lived and how they communicated also across space, you know, how they, what linkages they have, how far they were used to traveling. This building over here, by the way, Walnut Tree House in Leighton, this contains, in, I don't think it's this external bit, which you know, has a kind of Tudorish shape to it. But I think there's bits inside that which are really old, like really old. Some is, I think the interior of that is the oldest building in Leighton. Could be wrong. It's really windy. Jamie asks, <laughs> relevant to what I'm doing right now. Jamie asks, what's, uh, I love the channel. What's the best season for psychogeographic walking? For me, September, October in the UK, and primetime Flaneur action with the changing light and autumn colors. I think you're right. I think a lot of the time people feel like autumn, I have to hold my cap on, that autumn is the best time for walking. I kind of agree with that, but I really also like the long summer days, actually in recent years. I've loved midsummer for walking um, because I like just the, the light, you know, having that extended light, although, I feel like the city, for example, takes on a particular hue in autumn, winter. If you're looking for that idea of capturing the ambiences of place, I think the winter seems to release things that aren't normally there. I did my Roman wall walk in the winter and that was a great walk and you could feel the atmospheres bubbling up through the, uh, through the I was going to say the cobblestones, there weren't many cobblestones but through the brickwork. So I feel that has a particular vibe to it. Going past one of my favorite buildings in Leighton now, look at this. This is magnificent, isn't it? This is the old borough of Leighton, electricity substation. Look at that. It's just such, a, it's like a temple. This is in my book. Are there any urban myths from London past or present actually true? And does it matter? The second part of that, Steve, is no, it doesn't matter. I think myths are great. Myths, uh, a good story is a good story. Um, and I think we shouldn't always uh, confuse myth and, fiction, uh, myth and fact as well. You know, I think that's a really clear thing. You can enjoy your myths without having to think that they're actually true. Uh, uh, urban myths from London's past to present are actually true. One of the things I really like actually, here's, here's one, I'm, I can't, I'll just, I'll just lay it out for you. One of the great urban myths of London, I think, is the story of Merlin's cave, that Merlin the wizard had a cave beneath the Penton Mound, Pentonville Road, and Well Street running up one side. Now, that, that story, I've, the version of that story that I've read comes from uh, 1911, I think. It's a book called Prehistoric London, It's Mounds and Circles by Elizabeth Gordon. And what's interesting about that is uh, later on, there was, a, there was a pub called the Merlin's Cave Tavern. I think there probably was a Merlin's Cave Tavern there, and there was a cave where they used to charge entrance. Now, clearly, that would have been like a grotto that they created, I guess, in the grounds uh, for the sake of it being a pleasure garden. I don't know if they claimed for anything other than, you know, fun, that it was actually the, the cave of the wizard Merlin. And in, as part of that myth as well, um, Gordon states that at the top of Penton Mound, there was an observatory well, 
uh, that Merlin used as his observatory. And that, they did use wells as observatories. You could observe the stars by looking into the well and seeing them reflected in the water. Lovely urban myth. Now, I'm not going to stay here. That is definitely true. But what's intriguing is after Gordon wrote that, they did, there has been archaeology, uh, archaeological excavations around um, Anwell Street and Pentonville Road, obviously, because they built the reservoirs there. Uh, they were, they'd been built some time before. But they did find evidence of settlement around the area um, from like the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, where previously I think it would have been assumed that that area was wooded, the wooded slopes of the Thames and the fleet, and that no one was really living there. So it's possible that there was ancient settlement around that area. Um, and I think there is a cave under Pentonville Road. Did it belong to Merlin the Wizard? That's the question. Interesting question from uh, Edward here. Hi John, love your videos. I was wondering what tips you have for going on long walks. Uh, E.g. are there any good ways to prevent getting blisters on your feet? Always a problem I find. Interesting, I've never really had a problem with blisters. Now whether that is just a particularity of my body, <laughs> my feet, or whether that's because I take a lot of care of my footwear to a degree. Always wear comfortable footwear. I know that sounds like really obvious, but a lot of people don't. They, they go with different criteria and different ideas, right? Wear whatever you feel comfortable in. That might be a pair of running shoes. I did most of my book inside the London in running shoes because uh, I was walking on pavements like I am now. And you think, well, people, those shoes are designed to run marathons on hard surfaces. They can handle a long walk. So I think depending on the environment you're walking in, you want something which is comfortable and something which will keep your feet dry and also something that will allow, that is breathable. So in the UK that means you're probably going to need a pair of Gore-Tex boots for um, winter because it gets really wet here, you're going long walks over the fields, you're dealing with serious levels of mud and you also need boots for that because otherwise the mud will get into your shoes. So a pair of Gore-Tex, comfortable Gore-Tex walking boots for the winter. I use Merrells. And then for the summer, whatever you feel comfortable in, really. It can be a pair of trainers. Um, it could be a pair of walking shoes. I use Merrell walking shoes. Uh, I think they're called Ventilator. And they allow your feet to breathe so they don't get sweaty. That will help prevent blisters. Other than that, the most important thing for a long walk is, to, again, is to be comfortable. So wear comfortable clothes. Don't feel you have to wear performance clothing or stuff that's come from a special shop. It's what you feel comfortable in, but make sure you feel comfortable for the conditions you're in and the walk you're doing. A hat to keep the sun off your head. If it's sunny in the winter, a hat makes a big difference to keep you warm. Um, you want kind of lightweight clothing. So you want comfortable stuff that's lightweight and does a job. Layering is key to that. Layer up like a t-shirt and then a shirt or maybe a jumper, a fleece and then your waterproof layer on the top. Always take waterproofs with you. If you don't have waterproofs with you, your day could be ended by bad weather. You don't want that. Take plenty of water. I used, when I first started going out on really long random walks, I used to get caught out quite a lot by running out of water and running out of food. Well, you've seen me run out of food. You can deal with running out of food. You can't really deal with running out of water. Running out of water or fluid is kind of game over really can't go too long. You can go, go a day without food if you need to, can't you? And just free your mind. Free your mind. That's the main thing. I love this from James. Have you ever thought about taking a dog along on one of your walks? Uh, I have a volunteer of everyone company. I have a dog and uh, he's a pug. And if I took him on my walks, I, my walks would be no longer than about two miles and they would take about half a day. Hence, he doesn't come on any of my walks. I did consider it at one point, actually, when I started doing the regular videos back in 2015. I thought, oh, that could be a hook. It's like me and Rocky. Nah, don't work. Doesn't work. <laughs> Here's a question from YouTube. Do you see London in major decline? Um, no, not really. I think London's still one of the greatest cities in the world. And it's going through, it's going through one of its periods that it goes through. Um, and... Uh, it can feel like it, you know, at the moment, it's obviously affordability in London is an enormous issue. People have been moving out, they've been priced out of London in large numbers. Um, my forthcoming book actually deals with some of this actually. So it's not just me 
walking around wistfully wondering about the past, they actually document some of the things happening in the present, or in this case now, actually in the recent present, to do with communities um, fighting for survival, if you like, or people trying to sort of stop some of the more negative sides of developments. So that's been a massive problem, particularly in, uh, in the area of social housing, because there was always a lot of social housing in London, which helped build really strong, stable communities. And of course, a lot of that has now been uh, sold off, basically. Local authorities have sold a lot of that stuff off because uh, they don't have money or some of it actually is ideological. It's just a choice where they, you know, they don't want it anymore. <laughs> so they've got rid of it. And, you know, there are various issues anyway that have led to people being priced out of London. That's a problem and it can make London feel like a city in decline. But I actually, through the process of working with some of those communities and making videos for them, uh, helping to promote their campaigns is it really actually strengthened my resolve that Londoners are very uh, resilient. We know that, don't we? Because of all the famous things people talk about and you can see it through, going all the way back through history. So London will get over this hump, I'm sure, and we will come through this and it will be stronger for it. Um, but the spirit of London doesn't go away. And actually look at this community around here. A lot of the people living around me around here have been here for generations you know and they will be here for generations i'm pretty sure so i don't see london decline it's going through a period of change there's no doubt about that and that was one of the things i wanted to capture in the new book is this moment of change and it's, it's gone through them before i think that's sometimes we can forget get caught up in the moment of feeling like this is terrible and it's not like it used to be because it's not like you remember it was of course but then it wouldn't have been like your parents remembered it was or your grandparents etc etc but I think this is similar to that period when most of this was built, right, between 1860 and 1920. Most of what you see around London, very 60 year period. Imagine living through that period would have been, uh, I can't imagine what it would be like. What we're going through now is nowhere near that. It's another massive era of, it's an era of change. If you look at Stratford, for example, it's completely unrecognizable in many ways, or parts of Stratford from the, the place I arrived in 1989. So, it's comparable to that period of time, but it's not unprecedented. And, you know, change is part of the story of London and it will continue to be. And the spirit of London will always sort of uh, emerge victorious over that. The developers can't kill the spirit of London. I was going to say as much as they try. I don't think they even want to, actually. I think they're just trying to make money. Oh, so Martin says, what do you find to be the biggest challenge when making one of your videos? That's a really good question. Um, the biggest challenge I find actually is, is fatigue. And that's not really the fatigue of walking. It's like doing what I'm doing now, like walking and talking, it can be quite tiring. Um, particularly when I do videos where there's a lot more sort of information in the videos, which is, can be quite mentally tiring. So you tend to find, here's the thing you'll notice, is the videos that are quite information heavy, like the City of London videos and like the Bloomsbury video, don't tend to be very long walks. So I can't do that kind of thing for, for that long. The longer walks tend to just be me going for a stroll and a bit of anecdote, a bit of observation. So I think that's the thing, is fatigue in one sense or another. The mental fatigue from delivering lots of information, eventually I kind of reach a point where I my brain stops <laughs> and that's it and you have to it's, what's interesting as well is how long it takes to film a walk compared to how long it takes just to do the walk um, so when if I just do a walk it takes me half the time it does to film that walk and I don't really know why it's interesting because often you know I walk and talk but you know all those little things where I stop I'll stop to get a shot of these flats here which is interesting look at those flats over there this is still in Leighton in the streets around Leighton See this house on the other side? What do you notice? They're all new, aren't they? And this is where a bomb dropped. It might have been more than one. So uh, this is a classic indicator that this was once a bomb site. So just all those little stoppages really just add to time. So it takes twice as long to film a walk as it does just to go and do it. Love this, Daniel. As a LFC lifelong supporter, any chance of a trip to Merseyside? Yes, Daniel, I must do that. It's long overdue, I love Liverpool. Um, I love Liverpool, I've only been once, <laughs> there you go. I know the various supporters of London clubs will absolutely pillory me for that, but there you go, such is life. Within Greater London, this is William, within Greater London, what are your top three lost river, valley, urban or suburban sites? Or comments on London's brewing industry, keep up the good work. 
top three lost river valley or urban suburban sites. That's really hard to do, uh, William. I'm not a big fan of like top 10 lists. I know it's a popular thing on the internet. I understand why people do it. I think if you're looking at areas, I can give you broad areas. It is, it is so windy. I'm gonna walk back the other way because so I've got my back to the wind and it will help shield the mic. Um, the Lee Valley is a really rich area for walking. And if you start down in the city end, sort of Hackney kind of area, and then you walk out, if you can get to Hertfordshire, even if you just walk out the edge of London, sort of through Ponders End, Edmonton, Enfield, you'll see such a, you'll see all the landscapes in one, in one setting. Um, another area, the River Fleet, if you walk along the River Fleet, lost, again, a lost river, it's a valley, that takes from Hampstead down to the Thames, that takes you through so many rich territories, so many stories. That's fantastic. And the third one would be, I really like the West London Industrial Belt as well. I haven't been over there for a while, but I usually get a real pang to go there at least once a year. So I'd say there's three. And your other question was London's brewing industry. It's amazing, isn't it, London's brewing industry? It's sort of really taken off, I think, at one point, wasn't it? No, I was going to say there's more, I think, I read somewhere, there's more breweries in London now than at any other time. Any other time. Can't be any other time, can it? Perhaps. There's lots. There's so many. Whether that's the case after the pandemic or not, I don't know. But there's loads, and the beer's usually, like, delicious. So it's an amazing thing. It's just a shame that we're, that we're losing pubs as well so you've got to find a balance between breweries and uh pubs because tap rooms aren't the same are they as a pub you know like a pub i like to go and sit in a pub with a book and a nice pint bag of crisps sit in the corner just be mellow tap room is like an event isn't it you can't just go for like a quiet drink in a tap room i feel wow ricky says which north american cities would you like to explore that's a really good question. Well, I've, I've explored a little bit of LA and New York, and that is, I've really enjoyed those experiences. I'd like to explore them more. I've never been to San Francisco. would love to go to San Francisco. Um, I've never been to Seattle. would like to go there. I'd, never like, I'd like to go to somewhere in the deep south as well, like New Orleans, maybe. I think that would be really good. And also Chicago, the Windy City. I went through Chicago on O'Hare airport once on the way to Iowa. That was an interesting experience. Fairfield, Iowa. They'd be good. And somewhere in Texas, maybe like, I know everyone says Austin, don't they? But it, they say Austin because it's a very un-Texas place. So maybe if Austin isn't typical, of, if Austin is a little bit like San Francisco, then maybe I'll be better off going somewhere like Dallas or Houston. Yeah, that'd be cool. Do you lament the loss of so much architecture in London when you see the awful buildings that get put in their place? That's from Red Jack. And again, that relates to the subject of the sort of the good chunk, the first half of my book that's coming out soon. <laughs> when it's published, I won't talk about anything else. Do I lament? Yeah, I do lament the loss of so much architecture. It's, I think it's criminal the way we've destroyed so much of our architecture. Uh, a lot of it doesn't need to be removed. There's some people would say a lot of the old buildings aren't fit for purpose anymore. I get it. Um, but a lot of it gets removed gets removed because it's um, it's inconvenient, you know, it's an unprofitable use of the space. Um, and much of what gets put in their place is incredibly uniform and incredibly unimaginative and doesn't have any sense of civic pride about it or art artistic merit or architectural merit. Um, there's a bit in the book that uh, talks about, in the new book, that talks about this. There's a, it was an exhibition put together by a pan campaign group called Reclaim London called um, ubiquitously unique and it showed all these um, architectural elevations of a number of new schemes in London all with their claims of originality and it just shows how they were all completely uniform so many new developments could be anywhere in the world um, and I don't think you could necessarily say that about the development of Victorian London which again was a huge era of development it was controversial at the time in many cases again some of this is documented in the book it's not a very it's not a completely one-sided account so um, yeah, it does make me sad. It does make me sad. I, you know, in whose interest is it? Who's it for? You know? Oh, it's a good one for, from Eva. It says, hi, John. 
do you have a favorite type of architecture and if so what is it i think from this i think we tend to i tend to be really drawn to a sort of art deco i really like a bit of art deco i think it's the curves and the lines something really appealing about the curves and the lines of art deco architecture oh actually i need to do a shout out actually but i will i'll send this individually happy birthday katrina happy birthday katrina hope this isn't reaching you too late but i will I'll send this to your, your lovely partner who requested this uh, as an individual clip. Let's put it in the Q&A as well. Happy birthday, Katrina. Why do you walk everywhere when you could just drive? Oh, I love that, Kelly. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I can't drive, so there you go. Also, walking is great, isn't it? Isn't it? So it's good for your mental health. It's good for your physical health. You engage with the landscape. You are in the landscape. You're not in it. You're in a pod. If you're in a car, you're in this little sealed metal pod. You're not engaging with the world. I understand many people have to drive either because they've got mobility issues or it's just practical as part of their job or they live in an area that doesn't have great public transport lots of reasons i'm very fortunate to live in a city that has great public transport so i can get around i'm also very fortunate to have good physical health um, all those things considered walk is the best way to experience any place it's also just really enriches your soul it enriches your life you'll be better for it the more you can walk thank you for that question i appreciate it someone said i'm visiting from canada <laughs> and have become obsessed with Wanstead. That's an interesting idea, isn't it? Someone from Canada has become obsessed with Wanstead. I love that idea. Wondering about the stone ball near the temple. Only, uh, only one and just sitting on the ground. Was it part of anything else, perhaps? Oh, do you know what? I don't really know. But what I, the reason I'm going to include this is somebody else will. There's plenty of like real Wanstead history buffs who watch the videos, hopefully. I'll be watching this particular one. My guess is that it would be something to do with Wanstead House. I mean, that's the kind of obvious thing. Um, there are a few bits of it laying around all over London, really. But that's what I would think, the great Wanstead House. Again, I will link below to my Wanstead Park history video. Interesting. Uh, this is a good one from Lee. Um, do you do hikes and traditional mountain hikes and walks in nature? I know in the past you've done country walks but one that if you ever seek out hill walking and mountain walks. I've been on a few in Greece and Italy in the past, uh, mainly seeking to get away from tourists and get out in nature. Um, there's a bit of hill walking, but I suppose, I mean, I guess you don't count the Chilterns. I mean, I count the Chilterns as hill walking. There's a few of those. I think one recently, didn't I? That's the source of the River Lee, Sharp and Ho Clappers. That's a bit of hill walking uh, around the Chilterns. Where else? I mean, there are a few. Yeah, not mountains though. I haven't done any mountain walks yet, not really. I haven't done any that kind of thing for a long time. Not since, well, I went backpacking in, in Thailand and did a bit of uh, jungle trekking there. Went up into the mountains and the Golden Triangle. It was amazing. I wanted to do more of that. And I did a bit in Italy um, back in the day, as people say, back in the day, um, when my in-laws lived there. And we walked there. That was kind of, that's the foothills of the Apennines. I always wanted to go back and walk through there, through that valley, that was amazing. I like this question, and although it's a variation on one I feel like I've answered before, I'm gonna answer it again, because I like it. <laughs> it says, if you had to spend a week living in old London conditions, would you pick A, Roman era, B, Shakespearean, or C, Victorian? Hmm, that's good, because I, you know, I think I've said I'd like to visit Roman era London, or just after the Roman, uh, but have experienced the living conditions, I think Victorian, just be a bit grim. Also, it's not massively unfamiliar. Look, a lot of people live in Victorian houses, don't they? I so I've got, I've plumped for Shakespearean conditions because I think, I think it would have been, I think there would have been a bit of fun as well. I mean, it would have been hard, but it would have been a bit of fun. I mean, I've, I remember hearing somewhere or reading somewhere that that's when people used to drink, <laughs> they used to drink beer instead of water because you couldn't drink the water. So they had a kind of low strength beer that they drank all day. Right, that's what Queen Elizabeth I had for breakfast, was a pint of ale and roast beef. Sounds fun, right? This is a really good question from Stephen and relates to, I think, my Leebridge Road video recently. And he says, I'd like to ask your opinion on the development of cycleways in London, uh, especially in historical and culturally important areas. Do you think this should be a priority for councils? And to what extent do you think cycle-centric and traffic-free planning influences surrounding neighborhoods and communities? And this is interesting because when they introduced, what was it called, Mini Holland schemes, they called it Mini Holland in Waltham Forest. And they, they were five or six pilot boroughs. I'm not entirely sure what they've called that in other places, but it was quite controversial. And 
It was to do with you know, improving cycling access, cycle safety, improving cycleways, um, and traffic calming measures as well to make places more cycle friendly predominantly. And also, I suppose, by proxy, I think there was an element of making it pedestrian friendly. That's where my opinion is going to come in. Um, and what it did is it became, it became quite controversial. I mean, there, there was a, there's an element of that which could be seen by some people as just being reactionary from drivers not wanting any restrictions and going, why? Why can't we just drive where we want, when we want? There's that, but then there was also kind of more, say you could say objectively quant justifiable, um, a knock-on effect of where when they created cycleways in, you know, historical areas, maybe areas where there are um, planning restrictions around what you can do to your house or, what you, or heritage areas. What it did is it pushed the tra <laughs> load of traffic into the other areas that, where the property was less valuable. So it looked like the, the traffic calming was being done for the benefit of the better off people with the higher value ha houses at the detriment of the people living in the kind of like lesser valuable properties and so suddenly those places became really congested and it wasn't necessarily particularly well executed even if the idea was a commendable idea um, so yeah so it's not always so sometimes you know like i say the what does it say uh the road to hell is paved with good intentions or something i'm massively in favor of it i'm not a car person i'm sure you will have picked that up by now i've never learned to drive either so I'm in favour of anything which makes cities more um, cleaner, less polluted and more pedestrian friendly. I would say though as well, the other thing about the execution of the cycleways in Wolfham Forest is they haven't always made it safer for pedestrians. They've brought pedestrians and cyclists closer together than they were when the cyclists were just out on the road by putting um, cycle paths, cutting across um, footpaths, pavements, I mean, this is a bad example, obviously there's none here. It is actually quite dangerous, particularly for someone that's walking with small children or the old people. Bikes now, a lot of bikes now, are big, heavy vehicles. They've got electric bikes now, they're pretty much like motorbikes. They can go really fast and the machines are really heavy. If they were to hit a child, that'd be really bad. So bringing pedestrians and that kind of vehicle closer together has a degree of jeopardy with it. Um, I don't think we're anywhere near places like well Modena where I used to live where they had fantastic cycleways that were very well separated from pedestrians and I, I mean I wouldn't ride a bike in London I don't think it's safe enough to ride long distances by bike I've tried it a couple of times I wouldn't do it I think I think we need to do it I think London's still a pretty congested polluted city I don't think we handle traffic very well um, but the problem is I mean, the outer boroughs of London, what they call the donut, is still a very car-centric environment. So I think we've got a long way to go to encourage people to not drive short distances, you know, don't get in your car to drive to the shops, that kind of thing. If you, if you are able to walk, and some people don't have that privilege, but if you are, I think that's something we need to do more to encourage people to get out of their cars and to walk more. Still a lot of hostility towards cyclists in London. I think so we've got a long way to go um, I think the heritage element of it I'm not sure if that should play a role because like I say when they did it in Walthamstow they pedestrianized Walthamstow village kind of and made it more cycle friendly and they just pushed the traffic on the other side of Ho Street and it really kind of angered a lot of people about the way it was executed I think they learned a lot from that and I think they've improved it but I know around here in Leytonstone I think the separation isn't really there you saw, you saw it the other week when I was walking along Lee Bridge Road. You've got people bombing along there right next to you. And like I say, those bikes, they're not like the old, the old things I used to ride around on. <laughs> but I'm in favour of cycling. I mean, obviously, you know I'm in favour of more walking. So Mick has um, just sent me a very flattering message, which I'm not going to read out, but it's really lovely what he says about um, he appreciates the accessibility of the way that I put across what I've got to say uh, sort of you know being quite jargon free as much as possible and that's something that I'm I've always been very keen to do that I think what well, this activity that I'm engaged in wandering around talking about stuff shared heritage buildings that kind of thing the landscape rivers something that belongs to everything so I don't something that belongs to everyone so I don't want to kind of hide it behind 
kind of, I was about to say, obtuse language. Obtuse is a little bit of an obtuse word, isn't it? <laughs> but you know what I mean. Jargon heavy language, because, uh, you know, this is something everyone can talk about, I think. Um, so he says, why haven't you got a TV series? Which is lovely. I don't know. Why haven't I got a TV series? Um, I think the reason I haven't got a TV series, there's a number of, well, you could say there's a number of reasons. I'm sure, objectively, a lot of people here would be going, lack of talent would be the, <laughs> would be the primary one. But um, back in the day, actually, I had a job as a, as a TV development producer once upon a time. So it was my idea to come up with ideas for TV shows and pitch them. And this kind of thing that I would do, like walking around, is almost completely dominated by people who already have a profile on TV. So that kind of genre is you want to see a familiar face doing something you're not used to them doing. That, you know, so it would be Joanna Lumley. Well, in fact, Griff Rhys Jones did a thing on Rivers, isn't it? I mean, Griff Rhys Jones is an actor, right? <laughs> Comedian. So that's what, that's the kind of person they go for to present that kind of thing. Um, but there was somebody who contacted me actually who had a production company. It was quite a, you know, well-experienced executive producer and he put together a, uh, a little proposal and you pitch it around and there was a little bit of interest from one of the channels for daytime TV so I'd love to do it and who knows I'll just keep doing this do it you know do it for, for you I mean this is my TV show right this is an odd episode <laughs> this would be like a red button episode wouldn't it the Q&A but I'm happy doing this but yeah I'd love a TV show but you know you got to earn that right you got to earn that Griff Rhys Jones he's done his he's done the hard yards so this is, a, this is a good question from Paul. He says, um, long time viewer, I remember Paul. Long time commenter as well, thank you so much. Just really appreciate everyone's support over the years. It's massive. Uh, as a, Lon a London-born guy whose family left London due to the way, life, way of life there and various changes, do you ever get the desire to leave London? In the time of doing your videos, are there any changes you can feel arising in London which you feel a little sad about? Honest truth is, I don't really ever get the desire to leave London. Um, I mean, I have, I mean, I have left London and I've come back. So I suppose that that's the experience I've had of that. Um, I left in my early twenties to go travelling, and I lived in Sydney for a few years, and I loved it in Sydney. Didn't want to come back. If I was honest with you, if I'd have known when we came back to London then initially that we'd stay, I don't know how I'd feel about it. I had to come back. I've been away for three years, and also I wanted to do a bit more travelling. I wanted to see my family. And my friends but um i loved our life in sydney oh this is a this is a nice one from um <laughs> i like this it says hi not a silly jazz and dave question this time that was a good question i think the jazz and dave's question uh, are there any short film documentaries on the horizon in a similar vein to the london perambulator that's a good question um the honest truth is yeah i've planned a few actually over the years and i've not managed to well do them really I don't know why I did actually plan a follow-up to the London Perambulator with Nick Papadimitrio and we shot the first part of it 2015 that's on this channel we did a walk to Twyford Abbey but then we screened that in a festival I think it showed us that we we didn't know really where to take it next I think London Perambulator worked really well as a kind of profile film so yeah the film uh, in that sort of vein I wanted to make was I wanted to make a film about the North Circular a walk around the North Circular and I kind of even wrote a treatment for that and never got around to filming it. And I still mean to do that at some point, but it just becomes more and more distant. And the reality is actually, is when I do these videos weekly, it makes it really hard to take on a bigger project like that because of the kind of weekly rhythm of doing this is where would I find the kind of focus time to do it? When I did London Overground with Ian Sinclair, that crossed over with the regular YouTube videos and it wasn't even actually quite managing to do them weekly then and I still had to take a chunk of time out from the YouTube channel to do that. I love the name of this road, look, Horbridge Road and I always wondered whether that had anything to do with the Phillybrook, Leighton Stone's Lost River, but I don't think it did. A secondary question, but I think it's a related one. Is there any accessible archive or playlist somewhere to access films like this, London Perambulator, and um, films with a similar feeling to them, like the A13 Road movie. I'm sure there's more out there like this, but I haven't seen or even find the depths on YouTube. I'd say the best place to look for that uh, on YouTube for a playlist would be the London Screen Archives. And I say that because I know that they have the A13 Road movie, I think, on a playlist in the London Screen Archive. 
They might have even added London Perambulator to it. So I'd say try the London Screen Archives on, uh, on here, on YouTube. I love this question. It says, um, I love those walks. Here's a crazy one. Have you ever felt drawn to a specific area or place that truly and deeply made you cry? That's from Tati. That's really good. Uh, truly did no, not cry. I mean, there's a place I used to be really drawn to all the time. It was, it made me feel very, um, I don't know quite a way to say it, but it was along the River Fleet. And uh, it's a place, an area called Black Mary's Hole, actually. And um, it's near the Mount Pleasant Sorting Office. I used to walk through there at night. It had a really powerful feel to it. And now I'm really drawn back to that area around uh, the Angel Islington, those streets that lead up from Rosebury Avenue, Amworth Street, up to the top of Pentonville Road, through to the Barnsbury Estate. That makes me feel, I feel a very deep, strong, sort of sentimental connection to that area because it's where we lived when my kids were born. And that's where I used to walk around with them when they were little in a pram. And um, yeah, that makes, it does, you know, it makes me feel very kind of mawkish and sentimental walking around there. Yeah, I love it, Ron. And that's the area I would say, and it also intersects with the whole Black Mary's whole thing as well. So, yes, that's my answer. Oh, here's a good thing. It's a question from Doors of Britain. That's a good one, isn't it? What do you think would help to create and promote more urban storytellers such as yourself? I love that. I think, um, I think maybe encouraging people that they have a voice, that you don't have to be an expert, you don't have to have any particular learning or skills that just sharing your experience or just actually being willing to go out and find stories and find interesting people and communicate that to the world would help promote it i think removing those kind of barriers of feeling like you have to have some kind of training or expertise in order to do this i mean you could literally if you've got one of these phones you've got all the tools you need to either start a youtube channel start a blog you could do it on instagram TikTok. And all these platforms are there and they're completely free to access, apart from obviously the price of an internet connection. And um, it's, there's a big audience there and there's people who really, who really appreciate that type of content. So I would say if you've ever thought of doing it, if you've got any interest in it, just start tomorrow and you'll learn as you go. You'll work it out as you go and you will find an audience and people will really appreciate what you do. Um, so maybe that's what you can do. I can <laughs> say things like this. I think just go for it. And if you find one other person, if you're interested in this, like Doors of Britain, if you do it yourself, if you feel like, or if you know somebody else, then you encourage them, you know, and, and um, find those voices, amplify them, and uh, take it from there. But I love this little urban garden they created here. It's great, look, ladybirds and beetles. And this is a scheme they've done in Wolfham Forest. I can't remember the name of the scheme. I think it's called, um, Create, no, not creative spaces. Anyway, something to do with communities basically nominate spaces to be, um, have a kind of artwork, actually. I think they are public artworks. It needn't be ecological in any way. It could be a sculpture, it could be anything. And I actually, well, I say worked with, I actually kind of gave some advice to one of the people bidding for this space where they wanted to connect this spot here to the buried River Fillybrook, which is down there and they wanted to um, pipe the sound from the Philly Brook to here so you could listen to the Philly Brook. Isn't that lovely? This is great though, isn't it? And this was just a triangle, concrete triangle. People love this little space. This is an easy one. Ian says, do you have a favorite stretch of coastline in the UK? I'm thinking of a few days away on the coast. But, uh, my favorite stretch of coastline is the Suffolk coast. I love that bit around Southwold. That's my favorite and North Essex. North Essex and Suffolk coast. Definitely my favorite stretch of coastline. Have you ever felt unsafe on any of your walks? Says Art. Some of your recent walks have been in areas I know very well. And even I felt a little uneasy there at times. I find central London is where I feel safest out of walking. No, well, yes, I have felt unsafe, but never in built up urban areas. The places I felt unsafe have been on narrow country roads where there's a lot of traffic and there's nowhere to walk shouldn't i don't know how that's even possible to have a road without a space for pedestrians you get it particularly in country walks and if i'm doing that in the dark it's terrifying or in the gloom even and you'll have seen me mention this in videos so the one that i felt most um scared is when i did a walk from 
Um, I did a walk from Waltham Cross, walking past another school. It's lunchtime. Very excitable kids, aren't they? I did a walk from Waltham Cross to um, Welling Garden City, I think. Yeah, it was Welling Garden City. And then in the evening, I ended up having to walk quite a long stretch along a road. Actually, it was by the River Lee. And either side of me was, was farmland with no footpaths and really high hedges and no grass verges. And it was around, it was about sort of between five and six when people were leaving work. And they were just bombing down this road really fast. And it was terrifying. The amount of times I had to squish myself back against the hedge and I could feel the cars going past my nose at speed. That was terrifying. And in the end, actually, I did, there was a break in the hedge where there was a little stream that was cutting out under the road. And I basically dived through the hedge to get out of the way of a car into the stream bed. I thought, well, worst case scenario, I'll walk along the stream bed. And I did, and then found a way out into this farmer's field and just walked across this field until I found a track. That was really scary. There's been a few other examples. I think on my recent walk on the Dengue Peninsula, similar thing, the light dropped. Six o'clock, people heading home, nowhere to walk. That's, that's when I had my heart in my mouth. So Sean says, have you ever gotten lost or found yourself in a spot that wasn't what you expected at all on your walks? Sean, you're clearly a new viewer. <laughs> Getting lost was always a really regular feature of my walks. And um, yeah, it was, um, I used to do it all the time. And almost, not deliberately, but I was never that concerned. But even <laughs> the times I get most lost is when I thought I knew I was going, when I was using a map, doing some proper map reading, then I'd get hopefully lost. If I don't have a map and I just follow my nose, I tend to be all right. But the best, <laughs> the best example of that, to give you an anecdote, of ex expect, you know, I end up somewhere I didn't expect to end up was when I was on holiday <clears throat> in Wales in Fishguard. There's a video of this, I'll link it below. And I just went to get some stuff from the shop. I said to my wife, I'll just go for a little stroll, get some stuff, only be an hour. And then there was um, a river that cut across the street and uh, across the road. And I thought, oh, I'll follow the river. So I followed the river and then I just followed the path and I went higher and higher into this wood, higher and higher and higher and deeper and deeper into this wood until I couldn't find my way back. And I was so high above the stream. I was like on this big ridge and I was like, I have to just keep going. I couldn't find my way back. And it was so steep and so far down. And so in the end, I had to clamber into this farmer's field again. I was like, I don't even know if I can get out of this farmer's field. Who knows, he might, <laughs> he might not be very happy about me being here. And eventually I found my way out of the field into a farm track. I thought, that's good. So I walked up the farm track and past his house. And he did come out and have a shouted at me. But when I went back to talk to him, to kind of go, oh, look, sorry. This is what's happened. I got horribly lost. Maybe you could help me get back to Fishguard, point me in the right direction. He kind of ran away. I don't know if he thought I was going back to confront him. Here's a good one from Andrew. Any plans for a video, Ari, the history of the White City? Um, not really. Actually, I did do a video a few years ago with a local historian around Shepherd's Bush, uh, which is great. I think actually, if you just put in Shepherd's Bush history into YouTube, you'll find that video. I will link to it below. That was great. I think that we sort of cover the White City and that, and he really knew his stuff. So that was that. I hope you've enjoyed this Q&A. Thank you so much for sending me those questions. They're amazing. I love answering these questions. I really appreciate you uh, sending these all in. Apologies to anybody whose question I didn't get to answer. I will try and go into the various comments and um, answer them. Obviously, there's a cutoff point when I've gathered all the questions together. So if your question wasn't answered, it may have been that I didn't see it before I shot the video. Um, but thanks so much for all your support on the channel. And as I always like to say, I look forward to seeing you in the next walk, wherever that may be. And I'm going to drop in here an image that was sent for a t-shirt design with that on it. And uh, I shared it on Instagram. Everyone loves it. So I think we're going to actually produce that. And I, I need to um, work out with, with, uh, with Claire production of the mug as well. We need to sort something out. So yeah, thanks for that. Anyway, take care. Catch you soon. Bye-bye.